Hello, this is Dr. Russell Jennings, pediatric thoracic surgeon at All Children's Hospital, a Johns Hopkins Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. I work with the uh, Esophageal and Airway Treatment Center there with Dr. Jason Smithers. I founded the Esophageal and Airway Treatment Center at Boston Children's Hospital, the first of its kind in the world. And we are now doing the same thing at St. Petersburg. And I'm here to talk about some of the challenges and some of the misconceptions about esophageal atresia. Esophageal atresia is a problem where the esophagus doesn't fully form from the mouth to the stomach. It's uh, thought to be, in most cases, to be a relatively simple problem. My thesis today is to show you why it is much more complicated than most uh, surgeons or patients believe, and really should be treated by a pediatric thoracic surgeon in a skilled esophageal and airway treatment center. I know most people know a little bit about esophageal atresia, um, but I'll tell you some of the expertise that's acquired by a pediatric thoracic surgeon as opposed to other types of pediatric surgeons. We don't have anything to disclose. Um, just to mention, the newest innovations in pediatric thoracic surgery really are occurring in St. Petersburg, Florida, um, with Dr. Jason Smithers and the EAT team there. Um, I am the founder of the EAT program in Boston Children's Hospital and now um, am a co-surgeon with um, Dr. Jason Smithers in the EAT program in Johns Hopkins, St. Petersburg. I want to talk a little bit about thinking. Um, it's hard to change people's minds. Some people have faith, sort of like religion and politics. It's unchangeable. There's no hard data. You can't hold something in your hands and change their minds, and they're never going to change their mind. It's faith. People usually have beliefs. They believe in something they have evidence for, but they can change their mind if new data is given to them. It's really an opinion or it's their current ideas. And then there's knowledge. Now, knowledge is important because knowledge is based on something you can hold in your hands, test, and becomes fact. In fact, it, knowledge is based on truth. And changing people from beliefs to knowledge or beliefs to faith is not easy, um, but it can be done. And I want to see if I can't change your mind on some ways of thinking so just be thinking about this spectrum while we're talking. The Esophageal and Airway Treatment Center is a um, big, complicated um, center headed by pediatric thoracic surgeons. It involves the airway and the esophagus, as well as the blood vessels in the chest and the heart. But it also involves things that people really don't think about. It involves the pharynx, which is the swallowing part of your mouth um, <clears throat> and the breathing part above the vocal cords. It involves the nerves in the neck and the chest, some of which control the vocal cords and the vagus nerves and the phrenic nerves to the diaphragm. It involves the pleura, which is the lining of the lungs, which is actually a very important organ. It involves the chest wall, which is the muscles and ribs um, of the chest. It involves the spine and also involves the larynx, which is the voice box and the thoracic duct and the lymphatics. So when we talk about pediatric thoracic surgeons, we're talking about all the organs in the neck and the chest. Um, the teams involved in esophageal and airway pediatric thoracic surgery is basically every team in the hospital. But most importantly, the leader of the team has to be a pediatric thoracic surgeon because those are the people who have the training, really experience with all of these specialties, at least in some form, and have the leadership and vision to take the um, complicated program where it needs to go. And it, the ability to coordinate and assemble a team which can take on any of these problems. We typically will involve uh, fetal, uh, for appropriate diagnosis and um, uh, coordination of care for anything that involves the chest or the neck in these babies. 
We will um, involve gastroenterology, which is key for the esophagus and the uh, stomach, as well as the upper esophageal sphincter and the pharynx. We'll also involve ENT or ORL, depending on where you are. They're called different things. Um, and uh, that's because of the voice box, the upper airway, and the swallowing mechanism and the hypopharynx. Uh, pulmonary is involved because obviously the lungs are so key to everything in the thorax. It's critical, perhaps the most critical alliance that pediatric thoracic surgeons have is the alliance with anesthesia um, because pediatric anesthesia with thoracic cases is different than general surgery cases of the abdomen, etc. We also have clearly very, very close alliance with cardiac surgery for major vascular um, issues as well as for cardiac issues. Intensive care is very critical to the good outcomes in pediatric thoracic surgery and esophageal atresia. We also have a very close alliance with genetics, plastic surgery, nutrition is absolutely critical to heal and interventional radiology. Also involved neurosurgery and neurology, as well as developmental medicine. So you can see that everybody um, in the hospital is basically involved with um, these esophageal and airway treatment centers, which treat complicated esophageal lesions. I just want to talk about a few of the innovations in pediatric surgery. I am so excited about this because these are the the burgeoning flower that is exploding in front of us of all the new things that's going on in pediatric thoracic surgery. Lingotracheal esophageal clefts, we have new ways of reconstructing them, which is much more effective than the old ways. Tracheobronchomalacia, it's diagnosis and treatment. We're not going to talk about that today. Stents, rings, in vascular rings, recurrent laryngeal nerve monitoring, chest wall reconstruction, stem cells, tracheal reconstruction, Tracheoesophageal fistula repair, we may want to make a separate talk on that. And all the new techniques we've come up with, tracheopexies and aerodopexies and new ways of doing even Nissen fund applications. Um, uh, the use of an ICG perfusion test to test the blood supply of organs when we move them, including the esophagus or the um, if we do esophageal replacement. And new, play, new ways of fixing... Um, uh, laryngeal clefts, particularly type 2 clefts with cartilage grafts, airway splints, and the new operation um, of a tracheal taper. We also have new ways of doing pharyngeal reconstruction in cases of um, caustic ingestion and radiation injury uh, from like cancer treatment, um, and uh, how to treat aberrant blood vessels in the chest, including aberrant right subclavian artery. But most important today, we'll be talking about esophageal atresia. Now, esophageal atresia only occurs about 1,200 to 1,500 births in the United States per year. There are many different types, and that's the first thing we'll, th we'll really go over. It's often associated with other anomalies, vascular anomalies like aberrant right subclavian artery, uh, <clears throat> uh, which crosses behind the trachea instead of in front of it and can be interrupt the development of the esophagus. Various types of vascular rings. Um, congenital heart disease is commonly associated with esophageal atresia of some form. Uh, mostly it's midline defects in the heart. I really won't go into that today. Tracheomalacia is, has about a 70% chance of occurring in esophageal atresia babies. Usually it's localized to the area of the tracheoesophageal fistula, but sometimes it's much more. It may be entire trachea. Uh, laryngotracheal esophageal clefts um, have a very high incidence in esophageal atresia. Typically, it's type 1, which are above the cricoid uh, ring, which I'll describe a little bit. Um, but they may be more extensive, uh, maybe type 2, type 3, or even in type 4, which goes all the way down. Uh, so they must be evaluated. Uh, in these children. It's not uncommon in, in uh, esophageal atresia babies to have things like um, imperfect anus or duodenal atresia, intestinal anomalies. Uh, that's pretty much commonly associated with these. Um, and there are genetic anomalies, some, some things like trisomy 18 and trisomy 21 and others. Um, so esophageal atresia is not so simple. It's actually a very complicated problem. 
and a pediatric thoracic surgeon can really help you work your way through these problems. Now, it's in medical school and in residency, esophageal atresia is approached in this fashion. There's five types. There's the type which has um, a distal tracheoesophageal fistula, as shown right here. This is the type that has um, a proximal blind pouch. And the distal end of the esophagus goes into the trachea. Um, and because it goes into the trachea, there's reflux of acid from the stomach goes directly into the trachea. And when that occurs, that's called aspiration, and that is a, can be a lethal event um, for the baby. So that is why when babies are born with esophageal atresia and we see gas in the abdomen on our first x-ray, which indicates that there's a communication with the airway, they will be sitting upright at 45 degrees. They'll be kept relatively calm. We'll try hard not to put a breathing tube in them because the pressure of the um, inspired gases through the endotracheal tube or through the breathing tube would go directly into the stomach and force contents into the airway. Um, and even more dangerous, an intubation of a child with esophageal atresia may go down that fistula, down the esophagus, and bypass the lungs entirely, which can be a severe problem. So that's the most common type of esophageal atresia, 85-87%. Um, then there's the isolated type of esophageal atresia where we call this pure EA, pure esophageal atresia. It's often misnomered or misnamed as long gap. It may or may not be long gap. Long gap means the surgeon can't get it together. It doesn't mean that it's a pure esophageal atresia. In this form, we can see the proximal esophagus, and we can see the distal esophagus, and the two ends don't touch each other in this particular form, but both are blind. They're not connected to anything. It's not rare to have the lower segment be long and the upper segment to be long, and they can actually overlap. And people often call this, for reasons I don't understand, a long gap esophageal atresia without a long gap. Or sometimes the slang is, it's a TEF long gap with no TEF and overlap. That's not what this is. This is a pure esophageal atresia. And the distance between the two ends is a separate issue. Um, <clears throat> then um, it's often taught that the next type of esophageal atresia is an, is, uh, has to do with fistulas. And a fistula is a connection between the esophagus. So if this is the esophagus and this is the trachea, there can be a connection between the two. And that connection is called a tracheoesophageal fistula, or a TEF. That connection is called a TEF. It's not, a TEF is not esophageal atresia. A TEF is a fistulous connection, an abnormal connection between the airway and the esophagus. So every time the baby swallows, or every time the baby refluxes, some contents will go from the esophagus into the airway, and the acid and the bile and the food can be quite irritating to the airway and can lead to inability to absorb oxygen, bronchospasm, or even death. It can be a severe problem. So a TEF is not esophageal atresia. Now, there's a couple of different types of TEFs. One type is when we have a, an esophagus which looks relatively normal. It may have a little bit of a stricture, and, the, and it connects to the trachea like this. And this would be the trachea. And that is called an isolated tracheoesophageal fistula. Uh, and in such a case, um, it may be difficult to diagnose. 
It may have a late diagnosis, and it's frequently associated with an esophageal stricture or narrowing, as I've described right here, a narrow part of the esophagus, so the food can get hung up at that point and actually be forced across the tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, that's not a rare type, although it's an uncommon type of esophageal atresion. The more common types of fistulous esophageal atresia is to have a, uh, a child with, with um, a proximal pouch, which has a fistulous connection to, um, uh, to the trachea. So we call that a proximal TEF in a child with EA. The distal esophagus can be down here below the diaphragm. And, uh, and that is often called a type B or gross, I mean after Dr. Gross, a gross type B esophageal atresia, which has a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula. Now, it's interesting because these are often missed. Proximal tracheoesophageal fistulas are often missed um, in people who don't really know how to look for them. Um, and even in experts, they occasionally will miss a very small proximal tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, so, but that would be a gross type B esophageal atresia or esophageal atresia with a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula, which is probably a more accurate way to diagnose it. Um, if you'd say gross type B, then people know what you're talking about. Now, the, now the uh, other simple classification would be... Um, a proximal esophageal atresia with a fistula connection and the distal esophagus connecting um, connecting to the trachea with two TEFs or even more. So this um, is a, uh, a would be a, a type D esophageal atresia in the gross classification uh, with a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula and a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. So there we have two fistulas, and it's not rare to actually have a third esophageal atresia or a third tracheoesophageal fistula in cases of esophageal atresia. So it's important to realize that this is actually the simple classification. This is called the gross classification um, and is used variably by medical students, residents, and uh, surgeons around the world. Um, but it really is too simple because what it doesn't tell you is some of the other variables which are critical in order to have a good outcome in the treatment of kids with esophageal atresia. And let me see if I can show you some of the other variables. A much more valuable classification system is by Dietrich Kluth. And he published this in 1976 with Michael Goderer helped him translate it into English from German. And he uh, looked at esophageal atresia uh, from uh, many um, publications. And the goal that he set was to understand them well enough that they can be classified. And I think this is really valuable because I have personally seen uh, many, many of these types of esophageal atresia. So, so the first type, which he called um, type 1, uh, is when the, there's a proximal esophageal atresia, the proximal pouch, and the distal pouch, the lower part of the esophagus, is below the diaphragm. So you can see here, we see the trachea, which is like this, and the proximal pouch is small. But what he's not getting confused about is the length of the pouch, because this pouch can be variable in length. Note that here's the diaphragm, which is the breathing muscle, and the stomach is down here. The proximal pouch is at, or I'm sorry, the distal pouch, or the distal esophagus is at or below the diaphragm. Now, 
there's variable lengths. Notice that in one type, he has the esophageal pouch approximately go all the way down to the diaphragm. And the lower segment attached to the stomach is still below the diaphragm. Now, this is a rare type, but this type is not zero. He also will occasionally describe a band or fibrous cord that occurs between the uh, upper and lower segments. And this actually is not rare. Uh, and so this needs to be identified. And the way to find the lower segment is to go f chase this cord down. This takes a pediatric thoracic surgeon to understand all this. Dietrich Kluth described this in you know, 1976. And that's just type one. He has almost, I think, 120 or something types. And this is what's important because to really understand esophageal trees, you really need to understand all these variables. Now, type two in the Kluth classification is when there are both proximal and distal segments that are blind with no fistulas connecting uh, the, or in discontinuity, not connecting uh, to the airway. And you can see here we have a proximal pouch and a diaphragm with a distal pouch here. And um, sometimes they'll have a fibrous cord, which uh, can help a little bit to find both ends. Duplications, and there's even been duplications with a cyst between them, which I have seen and taken care of. Um, and notice none of these are described in the gross classification that we discussed previously. But these cysts and these cords are critical to the management of these patients. We can also move on to uh, Dietrich Kluth's uh, type 3 a. And type 3A is sort of analogous to Dr. Gross's type D esophageal atresia, delta, because the proximal pouch, we have, a, we have the trachea, the proximal pouch will have a connection to the trachea. The distal pouch will not. Um, it may have, and I have seen this, multiple connections to the trachea. I've seen up to three connections. And the lower segment may be associated with congenital strictures. Now, that can occur um, in esophageal atresia of many types. That lower segment can have strictures or even duplication cysts. Once again, something which is seldom recognized, except by pediatric thoracic surgeons who are experienced in the care of complicated esophageal atresia. Oh. Now, <clears throat> another type of esophageal atresia is um, a blind proximal pouch with a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, Dr. Kluth calls these three Bs, uh, and they can have the any type of no fistula to the proximal pouch, but a fistula to the lower segment. And they may have a cord between them. They may, may be associated with strictures and duplication cysts. And note that this doesn't depend on how long the gap is. The lower fistula can go to the carina, or it can be way up here next to the proximal pouch. And so we have a variety of ways that um, the lower segment can develop its fistula. Some of these are easier to fix than others. Obviously, if they're huge overlap, it's very easy to fix. And if it's very far apart, it's more difficult to fix. The, the types that have a cord between them or esophageal stricture associated with the lower segment are not that uncommon. And that also has to be recognized. The most important thing is to recognize the fistula because it's typical that the fistula to the lower segment will be associated with tracheomalacia, and those fistulas must be corrected in a fashion so they don't come back. We can have more than one segment, uh, more than one fistula to the lower segment, um, and you can see that over here where we have the 
you know, the trachea. And we have the lower segment as a fistula and another fistula. That is not rare. Some people think that can't occur, but I've seen that. Also, this can have a congenital stricture, as we've seen. Those congenital strictures are often in the lower third of the esophagus and can be close to the esophageal sphincter. And we can have duplication cysts, sometimes more than one. So, um, as, as is sort of shown here, these duplication cysts can be hard to treat, particularly if you don't recognize that, that they're there and have to be addressed. Now, Dr. Kluth also um, went on to describe other more complicated uh, types of esophageal trees with distal fistulas. You can see many other types here, some with congenital strictures and with varying lengths of the proximal esophagus. Now, it's really important to note, <clears throat> notice this one here. This um, is a short gap esophageal atresia, and this is a long gap esophageal atresia because the distance between the two ends is so far. But in the gross classification, they're all exactly the same. They're both exactly the same type. And that, um, so it tells you that esophageal atresia doesn't say anything about the length um, of, the, of the gap between the two ends. Now, um, there's another type when you have uh, fistulas between both the proximal and the distal esophagus, um, and those fistulas don't say anything about the length between the two ends. The only thing that's important is if you have a fistula to the back wall of the trachea um, from the lower segment, your gap is necessarily going to be shorter than if you have just a lower segment which barely makes it above the diaphragm. Nevertheless, even if you have a distal fistula, you can have a long gap esophageal atresia. Um, and in cases such as this, you can even have a stricture of your esophagus in that fistulous area. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. And then now there are more types of esophageal atresia. There are what uh, Dietrich Kluth called type four, which are membranous atresias, which are when you have a little membrane or a thin mucosa that blocks the esophagus. And in, in cases like this, um, sort of like what I drew earlier, you can have the esophagus, it can have a fistula, and there can be a membrane coming across. So that is an esophageal tree with a blockade. That membrane may or may not be complete, and so it could force things across the tracheosophageal fistula into the airway. It doesn't mean it's not associated with congenital strictures above or below. Um, the nicest type is when you have an esophageal atresia with a membrane, but esophageal continuity, those are usually pretty easy to fix, um, but it does you do have to first find that membrane to be able to resect that segment and get a good anastomosis. Um, but it's important to realize all the complexity of esophageal atresia, which is often missed by people who don't treat this a lot. And I just used Dr. Kluth's descriptions as an example. Now, another type is esophageal duplications. Um, there are a lot of different types of duplications of the esophagus. Some are shown here, where you can have two parallel esophagi. Um, and you can have um, a mural duplication, where it forms like a cyst in the wall. Um, or you can have sort of overlapping uh, duplications as shown here. So the duplications are often diagnosed late because of esophageal swallowing difficulties. Um, and 
uh, need, they really do need to be addressed by a professional who's treated a lot of esophageal problems. Um, you don't want to, to have problems with these. Uh, so esophageal duplications. Um, and you can see here that there are um, type 5 can be a little bit more complicated with uh, fistula is associated with these uh, membranes and duplications. Each of these really needs to be understood thoroughly before treatment is undertaken so that they get one effective treatment and not a series of problems. Um, now there are also, Dr. Kluth um, broke, in, broke the fistulous uh, versions of esophageal atresia or esophageal fistulas into bronchi because sometimes, and this can get quite difficult, sometimes instead of having a fistula to the trachea, the esophagus might have a fistula to a bronchus like that. Um, or it might be an end fistula where the lower segment will come up and just feed right into the, typically the left main stem bronchus. Um, and in those cases, um, it can be difficult to treat, particularly if you enter mistakenly through the right chest because the left side is far away. Um, and so these must be understood really well before approaching them surgically. The, um, sometimes we'll have things like esophageal lungs, and you can have um, the trachea um, right here. This would be like the trachea. And then the esophagus will be in continuity, but the, over here will be the lung or the lower lobe of the lung, or some part of the lung. And that comes right off of the esophagus. We call that an esophageal lung. Um, that would be a type of a bronchial fistula in Dr. Kluth's um, uh, uh, expertise in his, in his paper. Uh, and th what really what I'm trying to show you is that there are a lot, a lot of variations. Um, of esophageal lungs, esophageal fistulas, bronchial fistulas, etc. And so approaching these really needs to be done thoroughly before um, treatment is undertaken so you can optimize the outcome. Um, there are even more very rare forms, like I've never seen this particular form where the trachea had one normal lung, and the, the other bronchus went straight into the esophagus with an esophageal atresia. So I've never seen that particular type. I'm aware of it uh, because Dr. Kluth has described it, um, and it would obviously have a high lethality. Um, it would take um, a skillful surgeon to reconstruct, um, <clears throat> reconstruct that with uh, probably pulmonary agenesis on that, on that side. And finally, there are the um, multiple fistulas between the esophageal esophagus and the trachea with no atresia. Um, and there can be one, two, or three. I've seen up to three, and I've seen... Um, distal strictures associated with these anomalies. And you can see that the formation of multiple fistulas is um, challenging because you can easily fix one or even two fistulas and miss the third, and then the child continues to aspirate. Um, and so this really needs to be thoroughly assessed before surgery, and we do that with bronchoscopy. Um, and these fistulas can be associated with many different types of strictures, some proximal to the fistula in the proximal segment, some the distal segment. And um, all of these variations, many of which I've seen and operated on, need to be addressed.
before surgical treatment is proposed. And then there's the stenosis type of esophageal anomalies, not esophageal atresia, but we can have multiple stenoses. You have complicated stenoses associated with fistulas, as seen here. We have a, a big fistula and a stenosis between the proximal and distal segments. Uh, <clears throat> these are not easy to diagnose, nor are they easy to treat. And because remember, we're also dealing with um, high incidence of tracheobronchomalacia. And one of the problems with the tracheoesophageal fistulas is there's a high incidence of recurrence, so we want to be able to fix them so that doesn't happen. Um, we can also talk about some of the complicated esophageal stenoses without esophageal atresia. In this case, we can have um, like this. We have esophageal stenosis. Um, we have esophageal stenosis down close to the diaphragm. Um, that congenital stenosis may or may not contain cartilage, and that matters about how it gets treated. Similarly, esophageal stenosis um, like this may or may not have cartilage in it uh, as a bronchial duplication component. The cartilage is very hard to dilate, and so probably needs to be resected. But fortunately, those are relatively uncommon. It's not rare to have a stenosis associated with a duplication cyst, as we can see here. Um, and that cyst uh, is a contained piece of the esophagus, so over time it secretes mucus and it continues to grow and get bigger form more pressure on the esophagus, so you get more esophageal stenosis. As that cyst goes from small, so let's say it's in the esophageal wall here, um, and then it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, you can see how it can compress the esophagus. Now it's important to realize the esophagus is right next to the trachea, so one of the other problems is that as it gets bigger, it may very well compress the trachea, which could be, say, it's here, as that gets bigger, it compresses the trachea as well. So these are called bronchial duplication cysts sometimes, or esophageal duplication cysts. You don't actually know until you get in there and treat them. But it's important to realize the airway component because that can be the life-saving component of this. Some of these esophageal duplication cysts can be treated with uh, MIS techniques uh, by just resecting the mucosa. And then there is tracheal atresia. These are very rare to have survivors, but they do occur. And that is when the trachea doesn't form completely, but rather it forms a little bit, and then there's a communication between the esophagus and the trachea. These children typically survive because the pediatrician at the delivery will intubate the child and ventilate through the esophagus. And once they understand the problem, um, they'll call for help. These Children can be quite difficult to treat because we have to replace or reconstruct the trachea. That should only be undertaken by an expert who has expertise in tracheal reconstruction. Um, the survival of these children depends a lot on the larynx, if they have laryngeal atresia or not, and what type of laryngeal atresia they have. And finally, the, um, there's... The, what Dr. Kluth calls fissure formation, what we call laryngotracheoesophageal clefts. They are pretty common in esophageal atresia. I think the number is in the 30% range. To have a small one, a type uh, 1 or 1A, between the two uh, vocal cord um, cartilages called the arytenoids. Um, and so when the baby swallows or the ch child swallows, he aspirates, some of the fluid goes into the lungs. It's type 1. Um, it can be longer, go across the cricoid, which is the bone in the larynx that goes as a big circle. Um, when that um, bone doesn't have a backside to it, we call that a laryngeal cleft type 2. Um, there's incomplete and complete types. And then if it goes down to the first tracheal ring or below, that's a tracheoesophageal or laryngotracheoesophageal cleft or fissure. Um, and that's uh, very commonly associated with tracheomalacia and severe aspiration, and are uh, hard to treat and good to have good, very hard to get good results. Now, now Dr. Kluth also describes 
um, some of the complications in patients that I've seen, and that is to have a type 3 laryngotracheoesophageal cleft that goes down into the trachea. And so the larynx is open, the whole cricoid is open, and the trachea is open connecting to the esophagus, and there's esophageal atresia, such as this, and there's a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, and when things like that occur, it can be very difficult to treat because it's unexpected. Uh, and many people don't know how to look for a laryngeal or a lingotracheoesophageal cleft and wouldn't even look for a distal tracheoesophageal fistula, and then they don't know how to treat it. But now we have to deal with both this cleft and this fistula. And, and those are two separate problems, but they both have the problem with aspiration. We need to treat them at one operation. And there are different uh, lengths of these clefts. And then Dr. Kluth is also uh, the first I know of to diagnose or to classify this type of esophageal atresia with a laryngotracheoesophageal cleft. This would be type 3, goes into the trachea, and two separate tracheoesophageal fistulas, which I've seen this before, and a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. I've not seen all of these components in one child. Um, nevertheless, certainly I've treated each one. I think the expertise on these very rare conditions comes from people who have treated a lot of esophageal and airway problems. Um, these are just some of the very rare anomalies, including um, uh, a duplication of the lung, which connects to the lower segment of the esophagus. I've seen that, but not associated with esophageal, tracheoesophageal um, clefts. And incomplete cleft, which I have not seen. I call that a tracheoesophageal fistula. So I bring this up as a comparison to the gross uh, classification of esophageal atresia, which I frankly find a little too simplified. So to bring ourselves back to that level, um, this is a gross classification. Type A, pure esophageal atresia, and on x-ray there's no gas in the abdomen. A type B, which has a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula, with no distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Once again, on x-rays, there's no gas in the abdomen. Type C is 85% of esophageal atresias in the United States with a blind proximal pouch. And the distal pouch uh, connects to the esophagus in a tracheoesophageal fistula. This is an esophageal atresia with the tracheoesophageal fistula. And type D, by the gross classification, includes a fistula for both proximal and distal ends. And Type E is an H-type esophageal atresia, and then there's the esophageal strictures. But as we just discussed in the Kluth classification, there's actually more than 120 types of esophageal atresia. This just makes it look too simple and like there's too easy to treat it. Um, but long gap esophageal atresia is sort of unique and more complicated than short gap. We mentioned it earlier that Sometimes esophageal atresia is easy to repair because the two ends are pretty close together. And sometimes it's really hard to treat surgically because they're so far apart. And it doesn't matter very much whether or not they have fistulas or clefts or other associated anomalies, strictures, etc. What matters is you can't get the two ends together. And so long gap... Um, is often mixed up and very confused with type A or type B in the gross classification system. Um, uh, and so we need to sort of keep hammering on this until people get it um, straight. Long gap esophageal atresia is more complicated because you can't get the ends together. The first time esophageal atresia was repaired was actually 1939. Before that, 100% of children died. And Millie Collins was treated with at Boston Children's Hospital with Dr. Ladd, and they did a skin tube. 
and took a series of operations until she was able to get the food into her skin tube and she would milk it down with her hand to get it down into her stomach. Um, and she developed cancer in her skin tube at age 38 and it was replaced with a piece of colon. And last we heard she was in her 60s. So repairing esophageal atresia um, is not um, been around for that long. Um, so when we treat esophageal atresia, um, first we see if they have a gasless abdomen or not on x-ray. And if they don't, we know that they don't have a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. We will typically place a gastrostomy tube in the first week or two of life, um, give, keeping them a new, um, uh, neutrified with IV food, and we prevent them from aspirating their fluids by keeping their proximal esophagus empty. We do not fix the proximal tracheoesophageal fistula initially because it causes scarring and could injure things. We don't need to cause problems at the first operation. But we do place a gastrostomy tube, and a gastrostomy tube placement in a child with a gastless abdomen, no distal tracheoesophageal fistula, can be quite difficult because the stomach uh, is very small, sometimes as small as an almond. And this congenital microgastria is because a child has not been swallowing any fluid in utero and the stomach was never encouraged to grow. And that just developed this very, very small stomach. Um, we, we will then place this, a special type of tube into the stomach um, uh, called a malacot tube. And that will not tear the stomach when it's placed. And then we can then inject contrast into the esophagus, and we can see just how long that esophagus is. We can see we can see a proximal esophagus, and we can see the distal esophagus connected to this tiny stomach. And that gap between these two ends is what we call the gap. And the study when we do this is called a gapogram. What we're not doing is pushing with metal rods as hard together as we can get. We're just trying to see how far apart the ends are. And typically, on our patients, it's about six centimeters, um, which is, in almost everybody's hands, unrepairable at one operation. Well, then we had to develop an operation to fix it. We learned this from Dr. John Folker um, in Wisconsin, Michigan, University of Michigan a cardiac, pediatric cardiac surgeon and pediatric surgeon uh, who developed a technique to grow the esophagus in these cases. And this shows how it's done. He takes the esophagus through an open thoracotomy or exposure, places some little stitches in it. These are the little strings right here. And pulls on the strings uh, over time. That can be a week or two or three weeks until the ends can come together. Once the baby's had the strings applied to the upper segment and the lower segment. Here, here you can see that these strings are actually pulling on the lower segment of the esophagus, like this. They're going like this. And these strings right here are pulling on the upper segment of the esophagus, this way. Um, and we pull on them until they cross, and we track it because at the end, each esophageal end, we placed a little clip, and that clip is on there so that we can see it on x-rays. Once we think the ends are overlapping, we can get a contrast study, and we can see right here the two ends are overlapping each other, so it makes us think, boy, we can probably get that esophagus together. It would seem not be that challenging anymore. Remember, that was a 6 centimeter gap or 5.5 or 6.5 centimeter gap when we started. Once we go into surgery, we can see that the two ends of the esophagus are overlapping. Here we can see the two ends are overlapping. And all we have to do <coughs> is, is freshen the ends up and we can sew them together. We simply take this end off, take that end off, and then we can sew them together. It takes a very difficult operation uh, to not that challenging. We've learned there's a lot of different ways to do the anastomosis or the repair of the esophagus. Um, 
The most common technique is what we call the cheetle, which is shown here. But never, we, nevertheless, we lay all our sutures in halfway around. Make sure each one is perfect. We then decide um, what type of esophageal anastomosis we're going to do. Uh, people who do a lot of esophageal atresia clearly understand there's more than one type. There's end-to-end, -end, like putting two pipes together. There's what we call the cheetle, where you make one end a little bit bigger by cutting into it because it's already small. Uh, the castellated, which is sort of like a V on V. And the slide, which is now our preferred type, um, which is the longest anastomosis and least likely to cause strictures. Once we have all our sutures in on the back wall, we do half at a time. We cross all the sutures, and this is a real example of what we're doing. And then we gently pull on each of the strings or the sutures until the esophagus comes together. Then we tie all the sutures together. So each of these um, sutures that you're looking at goes here, goes across the esophageal anastomosis, and goes up here. So here's the clip, clamp, here's the clamp, and here's the end of the esophagus. And here's the end of the esophagus. And as we pull on this string, that will pull the ends of the esophagus together. And then we can tie it down safely. Now, the, um, the hard part of this is that we have many, typically between 7 and 15, sutures in the back wall of the esophagus as we tie it down and so we don't want to get all of those clamps mixed up because they come in pairs we put them down in pairs and try to keep them all organized um, that is a non-significant challenge um, the next step is once you get the esophagus together is to go look at it and you can see here we started with a five centimeter gap. We put it on traction for a week. Um, and then when we came back, the two ends were overlapping, but the volume of contrast is considerably more. And then we performed the anastomosis. And you can see that it's not just stretching the esophagus, it's actually making the esophagus grow. Now, how can we? Um, We've done this many, many times. Here's an 11-day growth, 6.75, 6.5 centimeter gap, and it's on in post-op after 11 days. A beautifully large esophagus, and um, so a study was performed. I was not on the study, so I didn't contaminate it, which demonstrates that when you pull on the esophagus, you um, instill growth. Clearly with uh, replication of blood vessels, mucosa, and muscle cells. So not only does the esophagus get longer, it gets thicker and more blood supply to it. So um, this is a demonstration of the congenital microgastria that occurs in a pure esophageal atresia with no distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Here you can see a, this is a very small stomach. Um, that stomach right there should be considerably larger. It should fill the entire field in a normal baby. Um, that little tiny stomach needs to be converted to a tube in the side of it. The tube will go about right here and go out through the uh, abdominal wall. Uh, and we'll have to go around that liver right here so that we don't hurt the liver while we do it. Um, it can be a challenge. Uh, because it's so small. It is a mistake to use a balloon type tube in a congenital microgastria stomach because it will just tear the stomach. It has to be a non balloon type. So we use, typically we use a malacot type of tube. It certainly can be done through the telescope. Um, now, the initial results by Dr. Folker were phenomenal. In these very complicated uh, pure esophageal or long gap esophageal atresia kids who had gaps greater than six centimeters, he was able to get them all together, and the majority of them were eating uh, normal diets by mouth. So, phenomenal results. We've been able to replicate this um, uh, in now many, many more patients.
So this is a real deal. And now I think uh, attention-induced growth of the esophagus is becoming common around the country. Um, there are many ways to do it. Um, it is important that uh, primary or long gap esophageal atresia can be done uh, by MIS or by just by the telescope, so you don't need the thoracotomy. There are advantages to this, um, including uh, less ICU stay and less medications for pain. So in such a case where we can get the esophageal ends close together, as you can see here, these two ends are not that far apart. They're about two centimeters apart. Um, then they can probably brought, be brought together with um, uh, a telescope. I'm going to show some of the strategies for doing so. We, we, in through the telescope, we find the two ends of the esophagus. And here we can put, a, put the sutures between the esophageal ends. Here's one end of the esophagus here, the proximal end, and the distal end is in there. As we see through the telescope, we can then bring them back together and we get a nice anastomosis. Um, so we can do that a lot of the time. In fact, I think more and more uh, thoracoscopy or MIS techniques are being used to repair esophageal atresia. So I think that's probably a good thing. We can also do traction for growth of the esophagus where there's a long gap. And in those cases, uh, MIS or thoracotomy, sorry, thoracoscopy, uh, MIS roles for treatment of long gap esophageal atresia and developing internal traction really has some advantages because they have less pain, they need less medications, therefore they don't need to be in the ICU. Is this applicable to every child with esophageal atresia? No. It takes a, uh, an experienced surgeon who's very familiar with both open and MIS techniques to choose the appropriate operation. And if he starts MIS and converts to open, that doesn't mean he's a bad surgeon or her. It means that that was the best thing to do for the child. It's not a complication. Nevertheless, let's talk about how to do that. Um, in that case, the proximal and distal segments of the esophagus can be dissected out. You can see here we're dissecting out the proximal end here, and eventually we get the esophageal dis the esophagus dissected out. And you can see here... Um, nicely dissected out. Um, we can place some traction sutures in the esophagus, and we can then cross those sutures. This esophagus is being pulled on these strings. So we have the esophagus with some strings that are pulling it this way, and we have the other segment of the esophagus with some strings that are pulling it this way. And we tie those strings around the ribs so they can maintain a constant tension. And by doing so, we don't really need to apply uh, any big incisions, and the child doesn't have very much pain, so we don't need medications. And the good thing is the child doesn't need to go to the ICU. Because we don't need to go to the ICU, we don't have any time constraints, and we can be very patient while we wait for these two ends to grow. And here you can see this end of the esophagus and this end of the esophagus are very close to each other. So there's a very good chance we'll be able to get, the, get that together under little tension at the next operation. I hope that I've been able to show you why esophageal atresia is not a simple problem. In fact, it's exceedingly complicated, varying everywhere from a relatively simple uh, lack of an esophagus for a short segment to a hugely complicated problem with laryngotracheoesophageal clefts and tracheoesophageal fistulas and long gap esophageal atresia with esophageal strictures and duplications and tracheobronchomalacia and tracheoesophageal fistulas that have, uh, may very well come back. In addition, there are vascular anomalies, etc., etc., etc. This is not a simple problem. The esophageal atresia should be treated, in my opinion, by pediatric thoracic surgeons experienced in its treatment. And if there's a problem with the first repair, the child should be transferred immediately to an esophageal and airway treatment center where they can have the experience uh, 
and um, benefit from all the experience of the surgeons and their team to treat these very complicated problems. The best time to treat an esophageal atresia for a lifetime solution is at the first operation. Every time it's treated after that, there's progressive problems and uh, potential for complications that can be lifelong. I'm wishing you the very, very best, and hopefully we can all benefit from this education. Once again, I'm Dr. Russell Jennings, pediatric thoracic surgeon at All Children's Hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida.